It's a very beautiful afternoon, and I would like to talk about my favorite topic, which is meditation. It's the simplest thing that you can do. It's as simple as breathing. The only thing is that you're you're wanting to, you're desiring to, your inclination toward wanting to know the truth is part of it. And without that, it doesn't work. But when you want to know the truth, now, let me talk about that. See, there's part of you, maybe, that wants to know the truth that wants to come clean, that wants to stop being phony and to be direct and honest and simple, maybe like you were when you were a little child. But there's part of you that doesn't want to. Part of you wants to hide, wants to dissimulate, wants to avoid, avoid the truth. You know, have you ever done something wrong to some good person, nice person, decent person? And then you have to tell them what you did. It's hard, isn't it? It shouldn't be hard. It should be easy to say, you know, I did you wrong. I'm sorry. It's easy for people who are not honest, or who are not sincere, let's put it that way. The words come easy to them, but for a sincere person, it should also be, it should be easy. But it's not, because part of us doesn't want to admit the truth, we don't want to admit we're wrong. So, part of getting better is being willing to admit you're wrong. Some of you don't want to admit you're wrong, because whenever you've admitted you're wrong, people have taken advantage of that. They dumped all over you. They yelled at you. They held it over your head. And they would bring it up later. So you learned not to, not to admit it to people. But now what you must see is that it is, it is a, a good thing to admit quietly in your heart, not with words, but just you, you to wordlessly, from the heart, admit that you're wrong to the truth, to the inner light, in your heart. It's just, I don't know how to say it. Just let your defenses down against truth and just admit you're wrong. So there's part of, that's part of it. Then another part is, um, is seeing that you're wrong and realizing that you can't make yourself right. See, we've all kind of known that we were wrong, but then we tried to make ourselves right. And that doesn't work. So meditation includes those things but there's a mysterious reluctance. Remember I said part of you doesn't want to admit. There's something about human nature that doesn't want to drag, its, drag itself to a chair, close the door, sit quietly, and... And what? And experience reality. Something in you becomes antsy and nervous and, and uneasy and you want to escape. Part of you wants to escape into thinking, into doing something. So that's what makes meditation hard, but there's a way of dealing with that. There's a way of dealing with it. And I'm going to tell you what it is right now because this is probably very important. Maybe I haven't talked about this very much. 
When you sit down to meditate, you sit down, you close your eyes, you become aware of the little pixels on the inside of your eyelids. You watch that light, that warm glow of light. You look at it. And at the same time, you become aware of your hand, of your right hand, so that you very much sense your hand so that it becomes a little bit tingly. Now, that's the exercise right there. But what will happen is that you will find yourself beginning to float away with some thought. What you're going to do, where you're going to go, what you didn't do yesterday, where you're going to have breakfast, it's hard to admit, to even state all the different things, your car, getting it fixed, buying gas, going to the store. These things rise up as if they're, they want to keep you from meditating. And in a way, they, they do, because it goes against the grain. See, the human being is so constituted. You know, Animals are incapable of realizing truth. They don't have a soul like we do. So the spiritual realm is just totally alien to animals. But human beings can be aware of the moral dimension, can be aware of principle, can be aware of the Creator, and, but the human race came into existence by falling away from God. And to this very day, we, we bear with us a little bit of um, shame, embarrassment about our animal bodies, naturally. And we shy away from truth. That's the human being. We shy away from truth. Just like an animal, you see some animals at night, they move around at night, they shy away from light or from somebody walking by, they shy away. So we shy away from truth. But what you have to see is that the, the animal body that you inherit, the fallen nature that you inherit, the mistake that Adam made, that you, and you inherit that, it's not your fault. It's not your fault at all. You just, whatever you have, you inherit. And then you come into a fallen world with fallen parents and they don't guide you right and so on. So what you have to see is that it's not your, it's not your guilt. Then various strips are laid upon you, various um, yeah, trips. Various uh, burdens are laid upon you when a child, and you're accused of this and blamed for that and forced to do this and uh, this and that cultural practice and this and that weird thing that you have to do. And it becomes so much that you, you, and then you become resentful and angry. And then you yourself are ambitious, just the way Adam was. You go for education. You want to get an A and look down your nose at other kids that don't. You want to be rich and powerful and famous and have really cool shoes and a nice car and a handsome boyfriend and you want to lord it over other people and so they're jealous and they look at you and say, wow, she's really something. See, you have that kind of... See, even as Adam did, he wanted to be a big man without God. And so to be humbled, to be, um, to be quiet and to experience God. Now that's an amazing thing that you can experience the presence of God because you see Adam fell away from God. He fell away from God. Then he knew about God. But he fell away from God. He fell into the flesh, into the mind, into the emotions. And so to the extent that you live in the flesh, overly so. You know, you get too much into food and too much into drink and too much into friends and too much into entertainment and too much into music. 
And to the extent that you've done wrong yourself by, you know, hating your mom or resenting your dad or hating your brother or being phony with someone or stealing something, you know, that kind of stuff. Then to that extent, you, all, you, shy, you also shy away from truth. And then to the extent that you get lost in thoughts to avoid reality or lost in thoughts because you think you can plan and scheme your way to success and get out of your own mess and plan and set goals to become whatever you th you're tempted to become. See, it's the same thing that Adam was tempted to do. To all of those, to that extent, you, you yourself then begin to shy away from God's presence. But amazingly, his presence is there and you sense it as conscience. Conscience. Now, I've often said, I've said probably thousands of times that intuition is your closest link to God. And I've also said that conscience is, is nothing else but, but when you stray from intuition, when you don't follow your intuition, then you, it, it becomes 2020 hindsight. And then your conscience makes you aware. Intuition makes you aware that you strayed and it feels like conscience. So another issue that we have is we do, is that we 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 misinterpret things. For example, you we naturally misinterpret our conscience as being mean and making us feel bad, so we don't like it. See, we tend to like what makes us feel good and not like what makes us feel bad. So if somebody corrects you, well, it, it should be a nice thing if it's a, if it's the correction is merit, merited, then it should be good. But you don't like it. See, it doesn't make you feel good. And if somebody praises you, then it makes you feel good. So conscience doesn't make you feel good, so you shy away from it. And you tend to, to go toward people who, who, make you, who support you and comfort you and reassure you. See how that works? So that's the nature you inherit. That's the system that you have fallen into. But yet, despite all of that, and despite the fact that you yourself have made some boo-boos and so you shy away, nevertheless, God is still there and he still, I was going to say, is pursuing you. It feels like your conscience is pursuing you, doesn't it? That's just, it's God's light that wants you to come back. It's very beautiful. Now, a lot of us, we go a long time, many years, and we go to great lengths to avoid our conscience. And then we drink and we smoke and we take marijuana and we, we stay oh so busy and we argue against the truth and we do everything we can and we escape into thinking, escape into thoughts. And if someone catches us in a wrong or we catch ourselves in it, then we escape into emotion. Yes, we escape into emotion. So now what you must see is that you have all of that against you. But doesn't it say in the Bible, if God is for me, who can be against me? So despite all of that, it would seem that it would not be possible to get through. That with all of the, the inherited, the inherited nature that we have, the fact that you have billions of people on the planet, all escaping truth, all selfish, all misinterpreting things, all denying the truth, all not wanting to admit they're wrong, and you yourself having made boo-boos, mostly hating other people. You would think that you couldn't get through, but you can. Now Christ got through, and he prepared the way, and he is still there now, and God sends his light. So that with that light, well, what, what is the old expression? One, what's the expression? There's a very good expression about one light uh, extinguishes the darkness. Or one, one little match overcomes the darkness. I can't think of what it is. It's very clever. That's it. That light, you see, is still in you.
and that's all you need. That's why the meditation is so important. It's very simple. It helps you to get back in touch with what you know in your heart. And instead of moving away from conscience, getting closer. Now let's talk about thoughts. So how do you handle when you're when you're when something about apart from you is is reluctant, does want to meditate? Well, then you just go sit down and meditate anyway. You overcome the reluctance. You drag yourself to the chair and do it anyway. And what do you do when your thoughts keep rushing off to this and to that and this and that? You know what you do? You just watch it. You see, you're you're quietly sitting there looking at the, the little glow of light on the inside of your eyelids. And then suddenly you're lost in the thought of what you're going to do this afternoon. Then you notice it and you snap out. And you're back in the present again. And then another thought will take you away and you'll be lost in it for few seconds or a minute who knows and then all of a sudden you see that you were lost in thought and you're back in the present again so you just notice it that's all a thousand times a thousand 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 times you, over the years you notice that you were lost in the thought and you snap out of it it's very simple you just notice it you don't have to struggle you don't have to try to do anything you don't try to blank thought you don't try to think rosy thoughts. You just notice the thought and you're back in the present again. Do you understand? It's very simple. Just notice and you're back in the present. If you have a little emotion you've got in the world and you see yourself becoming, starting to get irritated, you just notice it and the irritation diminishes. If you get lost in the thought, you snap out. If you're out in the world, and then you carry that meditative kind of an attitude with you, go out in the world, but you have a little a little mental distance. And so you're talking to someone and you, and you sense you're getting pulled into an argument, you just stand back. You sense that something is pulling you in, a television, some music, something is pulling you into it. You just stand back from it. A little bit of distance. You see how that works? That's all you need is that little bit of distance. Just notice. Meditate every morning. Drag yourself to the chair and sit quietly for a couple of minutes or three or four or five minutes or whatever you can. That's all. Very simple, but very important.